Hey, welcome to the 246th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Ben Blair. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan. And on this episode, we have filmmaker Zaina Dura. She's here to talk to us about her new movie, Luxor, which is out right now when this episode comes out. It's a story about a woman traveling through Egypt. It's very artful and awesome and uh, interesting. And it premiered at Sundance. It was her second Sundance film. Her first Sundance film was made eight years earlier. So it's pretty awesome to track kind of her career. She also has like a family and kids and all those things. And I don't know. Personally, I love talking to people like that because there is always this fear of like how to stay creative and original and make art and movies that people want to see and also balance the rest of your life how do you balance the rest of your life and also she's making this movie in the most classically indie way where she's making big sacrifices she's traveling she doesn't live in egypt you know so she as a person who already had a few kids and also just had a baby shot this film you know i think is really inspiring and interesting and kind of there's a lot of different ways that we unpack how she makes a pretty scrappy film look and feel like a million bucks, but also maintains the artfulness of it. I think the the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, there's a little bit of improv and there's a lot of agility in terms of the filmmaking process that we talk about. And, you know, I think that indie films, oftentimes the solution is shoot it in seven days. And, and that doesn't leave enough room for the sort of texture that's imperative to Zena's filmmaking. Yeah. Have you ever dreamt of filming like in another country have you ever filmed in another country yeah i filmed in russia <laughs> oh uh, yes. yeah yeah <laughs> but uh but on a but, studio yeah, set <laughs> right i've done a lot of travel jobs certainly and so you know there's a gamut of experiences that would all inform how you make a movie like this that we, we go into a, a, d- a decent amount but I, it's funny when you said have i ever dreamt of something i think it's worth pointing out the idea for luxor came to zena in a dream yeah, and so I think that that's what I'm going to write in all of my director statements. Also, <laughs> yeah, it's a good story, but I think also very true. But so she does a good job of of again mixing the strategy and the artfulness of how she wants to manage her career and the way in which she wants to make films with the sort of inspiration and texture of her own process. Yeah, it's cool. I feel like I want to make a movie in Israel at some point because it's. You know, I've I've shot stuff in Florida and in Texas, but uh, there's a difference when the history is like 100 years old versus like 10,000 years old, you know, and there's something cool about experiencing, I think, a foreign land as a non-local person because you might have like some wonder and amazement that you wouldn't have if you live there, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I think what's interesting for Luxor is that I think it plays with the duality of that, right? This is a character who has been to Luxor and was drawn back, right, in a moment of crisis and in a moment of trauma, looking to heal herself. And so I think the audience presumably hasn't been there before. And so they get to experience it for the first time and, and to understand that wonder, but then also interpolate that feeling onto a person who's going through and processing memory and all of that at once. So smart stuff. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning that Zena is a British filmmaker, which means she lives in England. She's in London uh, when we spoke to her and we did have quite a few technical issues. So we apologize if the sound quality isn't as good as our usual episodes, but we still think the conversation's really awesome to listen to so so just beware there might be some some audio glitches well before we get into our conversation with zayna uh, we should talk about our patreon patreon.com slash just shoot it pod we've got hats at the ten dollar level we've got stickers at the four dollar level we've got t-shirts at the twenty dollar level um all of which you get as soon as your first payment goes through how's the um, stickers going have you been mailing them out i have not mailed the new the newest batch but i was caught up relatively recently so and if it's a but ten dollar patron and i mail them the hat do you mail them the stickers separately or am i also mailing them the stickers you should be mailing the stickers. Oh yes. my goodness! Have That's... you not been putting stickers in the no, in no, boxes? I have, I have. I'm just kidding. Oh, I have been. You got me. You got um, me. But just know that if you want to have my germs, get mm-hmm. the hat. If you want Matt's germs, 
Get the stickers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I cough on all of the stickers before I give them to you. So it's actually a two for one if you mail them out. Oh, cool. Because you're no mailing wonder stickers as well. I had yeah. measles three months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, so you can check out that at patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. Helps us pay our wonderful editor, Sarah Weirda, and our the rest of our team and pay all of our things that we pay for to get this podcast to keep on yeah. chugging. This time of year, we are reminded by all of the overhead costs of uh, of maintaining a show. So we appreciate it very much. Also, uh, as a thank you, we know that we can't meet in person. Normally, we'll do an end of the year show or a beginning of the year show live show. Um, but because we can't do that, we thought we'd put together a fun, casual happy hour, basically, on December 17th. If you're a patron, you'll get the information there. But if you go to justshootapod.com slash live, you can learn all of the information that you need there about how to hang out with us. It's going to be pretty loose, pretty unstructured. You know, Orin and I will MC a little bit, but I think it's just about reconnecting with the community, talking with people, seeing how you all can get to know one another. So um, it should be a nice, chill time, December 17th, uh, 7 PST, 10 EST. So if you're listening to this episode, the day it came out, and you're a patron, it's tonight, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Come hang, everybody. Okay. And with that, let's talk to Zaina Dura. So, Zaina, how's it going? Just kidding. So listen, folks, I know we mentioned the technical issues already. As we went into actually editing this episode, it turned out that indeed... We had uh, lost quite a bit of this interview that we did with Zayn and Dura, which was quite a shame because it took us quite a while to schedule this interview. Yeah, I was really, really excited for it. And we got a lot of wonderful insight from her that we're going to try and relay to you. But we did get a tidbit, didn't make it across the pond. And we thought that was definitely filled with insight and the nuggets that we love about the show. So we thought, let's go ahead and uh, play what pieces we have, basically. Yeah, so we're going to set up this clip real quick that we this chat with Zaina because so she did make this movie called Luxor that we've mentioned you you must check out the trailer and the movie and everything go check it out try to watch it she will appreciate it we'll all appreciate it. it's being released by Samuel Goldwyn which is an awesome distributor in America what up Sam what's up do you know they almost released my feature the hammer and when I told my manager I was like yeah this company Samuel Goldwyn is like interested in it he called me back I had texted him that he called me back he's like that's like you being able to fly and forgetting to have mentioned that to me while we talked in our first introduction. <laughs> it's like, oh, I didn't realize they were yeah, that great. It's it is like, a it is a name brand. It's like if uh, Focus wanted to distribute your movie or something, you know, like if, as far as like prestige indie labels, it's it's the cream creme de la creme, I suppose I should say. And it's not surprising Luxor played at Sundance. It won all these awards. So it's got, you know, some great performances. So anyway, check it out. But what uh, one of the things that we really focused on in our conversation with Zena, who lives in London, is how you go about deciding to make a movie in Egypt. It seems intimidating. And for her, she found it really uh, inspiring and much easier than, than at least it seems like at the outset. So we're going to talk a little bit with her about the locations, about her experience as a filmmaker, and about some of her experiences in Egypt. And when we come back from that to fill out the rest of the episode that we have to, <laughs> that we lost in the Atlantic somewhere, <laughs> the bites and bits that were recorded, Matt and I are going to come back and talk a little bit about our own philosophies about locations and movies, how we choose them, and how they inspire us. You know, how a location, you know, everyone knows, is a character for the movie and, and kind of what are the things we like about them and our pet peeves about them and everything in between. So first, we're going to talk to Zena, and here is that clip. Yeah, so basically, I was just saying that basically in England, I think it's because I went out to, to New York when I was very young. I was 22. I started the grad program there at NYU, and I my whole community was just like a New York community of filmmakers, and then obviously LA too. And so it was a really special group of people that I became a filmmaker with, and that I then went on to make Imperialist with a lot of them. And just like the NY kind of indie film, the New York indie film in general, um, mm -hmm. indie film scene in general. And your first film, your first film is quite NYU indie 
sort of vibe, right? It's like young people in the city, crazy night out sort of situation, right? Like, it, 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 I feel yeah, like that- I didn't see, I don't think that that's like an NYU theme because I was the only person doing that stuff. Everyone else was doing like very different work because mine was mm-hmm. mine was about like politics and like the kind of tension between politics and like being on the scene and going out and like mm-hmm. th- those kind of things. So it was slightly different, but it was definitely a very but influenced by New York, I guess is what I basically. Mean yeah, say. it was very much a film yeah. where new it was everything about New York, and you know. And then when I came back here, um, I I didn't have a tribe, and there isn't really a tribe like there is there. That's why people go there to make films because there really is a special tribe in New York of like indie filmmakers, and it's a very special place for that. And so when I came here, I was still in touch with everyone, but you know, very much like a FaceTime sort of thing. And then, um, and then I decided to make this movie because another film I was trying to make, I just needed, it, it had fallen through and it was really, 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 really close to being made. And I had this dream and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I realized, okay, so, okay, great. This is a great dream. I think this is actually feasible because you can really tell the story through the backdrops to the ruins. I'm sure Mo can help me get permits. Well, and, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to steamroll past this because I think this is kind of, kind of an interesting thing. You, when you say you had a dream, you literally mean that you had a dream that kind of inspired. You, you were, you were in a, a state where you were disappointed that the next film that you were trying to make wasn't going to happen, and then this story came to you in a dream, and the next day you were like hitting the ground running, trying to make it happen. Is that true? I was talking about to, to my DP, Zamira. She's not really my, she wasn't my DP at the time. She was a friend who I occasionally shot experimental stuff with. I was just saying to her how bummed I was at the film, wasn't getting made, this other one, and that I'd have to come back to it at a later date. And I was definitely feeling a sense of failure because I hadn't made a film in a while. And there's also that kind of like sort of stage as a mother, like, you know, I had two really young children at the time. They were like four and two or five and three they were super tiny and so you were in that stage where like how am I gonna make this work you know how am I gonna how, how am I gonna galvanize to get this film mm-hmm. off the ground and then I thought you know what this is just a great idea it's a simple film I'll make it really short like I'll make it in a short amount of time I shot in 18 days I'm not precious mm-hmm. I know what I need I, I, I edit so I know what I need I know what I don't need and, um, you know, provided I have good actors that I can work with, I, I knew that it would work, especially because of the backdrop. Were you, you were familiar with Luxor, I'm assuming, before you wrote the film, right? I hadn't been since I was a teenager, but I did, I did, I, you know, I'm, I'm, my dad's from that part of the world, so I really feel very at ease there and I can just kind of navigate mm-hmm. it, you know what I mean? It's not new for me. Do you speak Arabic? Um, you know, I, I do, but, but um, it was rusty. And I was petrified of having to direct in Arabic because I'd have to speak to the crew in Arabic sometimes. Um, we had a, a gaffer from New York um, my, that my DP brought with her, but everyone else, he, he communicated with the Egyptian gaffer and then everyone else was just Egyptian. And also Luxor, is, it's far enough out that like, uh, was it hard to get gear? You know, like you say you brought your gaffer from New York. No. Egypt is like me- like the Mexico of, of Latin America for TV production like and film production. Like <laughs> Egypt is where it all happens. Gotcha. Every other pyramid is like a f- is a film supply. Yeah, yeah, shop. sure. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a Sinhalese spray painted on the back of one of the pyramids. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but I don't you joke, but it's literally you. I mean, they, they're like a factory there and it's really good. I mean, the guy was doing our dolly, our do- putting down our dolly track. He would do it in like 15 minutes, a job that anyone else in the world would do in like five hours. He was doing it literally in 20 minutes. <laughs> well, you imagine, yeah, if you have like one of the world's greatest wonders in your backyard, people film there a lot. Yeah, and, and, and but they don't necessarily film the, those things. They film, they just do great drama. There's always been like a real tradition of theater and film there. And film there was also very sophisticated in the 50s. You had like a lot of Italian cinematographers in Alexandria and places like that, and it's like and like a lot of a lot of these earlier ta- um, Egyptian films look like Fellini stuff, you know, like that kind of genre. It's it's a, it's a really interesting, um, very rich film history there and literature. It was really easy to shoot there, in that respect. They That's they're great. used to shoots. Yeah. They they're nice to everyone. Did you know that going into it? Yes. Yeah, awesome. So, so there's a, a tiny bit of there's a grain of strategy to it on top of that, right? Oh, yeah, like, there was total oh. strategy. I'm like, this is a great yeah. dream. But if I had the dream in like Senegal, I don't know if I could have like manifested it. But I, <laughs> I, I knew like this great Egyptian producer. I knew, um, you know, and I always produce. Um, you know, I always get involved because I'm that kind of person. 
probably the, from the indie side of thing, I can just get stuff done. So, you know, I was getting stuff done, he was getting this, and he got all the permits. And because it wasn't an American mm-hmm. film, it was much easier mm-hmm. to get the permits. And were there any specific, because you were shooting in like, you know, quite uh, ancient and uh, fragile spaces sometimes. Uh, were there any extra hoops that you had to jump through for that? Like, do, did they help you manage that? Like, you know, when she's walking around Seti the first tomb, which is a tomb she first goes into, which is like a splendid tomb. And she's like kind of having this kind of moments of revelation in that she, um, we had three hours to shoot that. Like I had no time and it was, <clears> a, li- and it was a live set. There were like tourists everywhere. Not everywhere because it was still like not that many because of the political situation in the region. So like in the MENA region, obviously people, it's it's not packed with tourists at the moment, but, but still there were people, there were tourist groups going around and, you know, foreigners, Germans, Chinese, you know, Americans are people. And they would just walk into our film set and we'd have to be like, excuse me, could you hide behind the pillar for a second? You know, I've, I've had a very similar experience filming at Disney world. I I can imagine that's exactly the same thing. (laughs) Um, it's very, uh, lots of international guests and uh, a lot of politics about getting them to shut the music off for five minutes. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think there there is something interesting. Look, dealing with, uh, you know, a live set is, is always challenging. But I, I feel like when you're in a space that is a tourist attraction and where like likely people have traveled long distances to come you know, visit a tomb or Mickey's house, you know, you kind of, I feel uh, an extra layer of obligation just to kind of, you know, get things done as quickly as possible because you don't want to accidentally spoil someone's vacation due to your shooting schedule. Do you know what I mean? Like when you guys are on shooting in places like that. Aren't you kind of like, don't you kind of feel like you're adding to the experience of the tourists a little bit? Like, ooh, it's, you know, it's a tomb sometimes, and there's a film crew here. How cool Sometimes is that? it's cool. And sometimes they're like, what's this for? And you're like, oh, it's a mayonnaise commercial. Yeah. Zana, you said that because you weren't an American film, it was easier to get permits. Is that so if an American filmmaker like Matt or I went with an American production to Egypt, it would be more difficult? I think it would be difficult because you wouldn't understand culturally how things worked. I mean, I was like at a loss. Mm-hmm. Mo is like a top indie producer there. So he just knows how to mm-hmm. work it, who to speak to. He has a whole team of people. So as indie as it was, we still had the right people talking to the right people. Had mm-hmm. we been an American film, the mon- the budget would have gone up because, you know, so because we were like an Egyptian English film where the interface with 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 the bureaucracy was Egyptian, and very local mm-hmm. Egyptian and people they know from mm-hmm. other films, it was cool. Right. But every any American, if Matt or I were going to make a movie in Egypt, I assume we'd find also try to find an Egyptian producer. Like, isn't that just how you film in other countries? Yeah. Or sometimes they call it a fixer, right? Yes. But yeah. the difference yeah. is that this guy isn't our fixer. He was our producer. So we were an Egyptian mm-hmm. film. That's the difference with fixers. They still know. Oh, they're the fixers, or they're the rental company. Like they, they, you know, they're like right. they're right. like doing the. But Mo was very involved. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's his film, and so yeah, he's and also to because I have an Arab mile. name, yeah. for once in my life, that came in handy. You know, like it was like. <laughs> cash in <laughs> yeah you know like i cashed in for the first time ever rather than being like stopped in an airport it was like oh wow like i can right. get a permit for this right so it was good i'm curious uh kind of a, a departure from what we we're just talking about but is your husband in the does he work in film or like creative i met my husband because he produces very obscure iranian movie called frontier blues it's brilliant by our, a friend of ours and that's how i met him because someone said oh you have to meet this guy we were at a wedding and they're like oh this guy's a producer you have to meet him but he wasn't really a producer. It was just like the only film he's ever produced. And he vowed never to produce a film after that because he thought it was it was totally <laughs> the most crazy thing to do. But no, so he's not. But he's very someone who does stuff like that, produces a movie, and then it goes to Locarno. Like he's kind of like into lots of different things and, and cultural things. That's cool. The reason I asked is because you were saying that between your... So you had two, obviously, Sundance films and some time between them. And you were talking about having kids and things and... My wife is an actor. Uh, Matt's wife is an actor, writer, producer, and director also. And I'm always curious about couples where they're both in the creative business and they have kids and how they manage to trade off kind of time, you know, in terms like to pursue your passion project. It's not even if you're both creative. So my husband has like a very stable job, day job. 
And mm-hmm. then he's like a kind of like, you know, for example, basically the other day I went down to the sitting room. It was 4.30 a.m. because I could tell he'd fallen asleep on the sofa watching television. And he said, no, no, no. I, I He was actually awake. And he was on a Zoom call with a guy called Dr. Bob, who has, what, has one of the like famed recordings of the the Grateful Dead. Sure, Dr. Bob, of course. Yeah. He was on this like massive Dr. B, him, Dr. Bob, and all these other kids from this boarding school he had gone to where there was this like group that followed Dr. Bob's tape. And it was like this whole thing about the Grateful Dead at 4.30 a.m. That's the kind of person I'm with. So I think that if you're with anyone interesting <laughs> who has interests, <laughs> um, it's always going to be a challenge because it's who's – whose time when you know but you just kind of you know i definitely think the sacrifice does go on the women still because uh in the end we're the ones who are physically giving birth and physically doing that so as much as the man can be there with you they can still be doing other stuff right whereas i obviously i look i made this movie with a three-month-old baby on set you know and i i wrote it while i was pregnant and i location scouted when i was pregnant it wasn't like it was but it's a different vibe like it's like i have to be a bit more careful i i realized i couldn't go out there when it was like 50 degrees celsius because i might collapse and it'd be bad for the baby and you know stuff like that so i mean i do think there's still a little bit of a discrepancy between male and female in that respect but i think that i have a great partner who when i went to egypt was fully behind me fully helped me my my parent my mom came out and helped with the kids we got extra child care you know like it was all it's all about child care basically any money you make goes towards child care i love i love that because again it's like one thing if you're like hey universal studios just called me they want me to make this movie they're paying me a million dollars it's another thing to say like hey i'm gonna take like some of our savings i'm gonna travel i'm gonna we're gonna have to spend a lot of money on child care and i'm gonna make this thing that has no distribution, and it's just like my bet on myself, you know. And I'm not 22 years old, and please support me in this. And to me, that's like, it doesn't matter if your partner is in the creative business or not, but a person that like understands that you are going to need to take these risks sometimes that are for yourself, you know, not for yourself, but to just leave, lead a more fulfilling life. Um, yeah, or to realize who you are. Really I mean, like, I am a, I, I identify myself as a, as a filmmaker. I'm a filmmaker and a mother. Mm-hmm. Like, that is who I am. If I don't make films, I'll go mad, you know? Like, I need to make films. That's just how I am. And that's why after, it was actually, not, it was eight years between the projects, nine years, because I I shot it in early 2019. So, it was nine years and I was and I, I knew I had to make something and I was like you know what I'm not going to be precious and I knew that it wasn't going to be like I wouldn't have everything I'd ever wanted in it like in Paris I was very lucky I got everything I wanted you know because I pulled strings mm-hmm. I was like in New York I had friends I had connections I could get like you know Oscar de la Renta gowns for free because my mm-hmm. a guy who'd gone to my undergrad university happened to run that fashion house like you know like I was so connected there so it was so easy sure. it was in Egypt we were very connected but it's a different kind of film you know and it's more about could you fly in more actors or you know we use locals I'm gonna say one thing I'm gonna stop the recording and restart it one time by the time you're back um, just look on the zoom we'll send you the new link okay yeah, so as Oren figured out uh, in that recording, I think we're going to keep that part in, uh, We did. that's where we hit those technical issues. And it's such a shame because we had a lot of wonderful laughs with Zena And revealed all the secrets of success as well. Yeah, yeah. If, if only we could share them with you. But no, uh, you know, I think one of the really big takeaways that was, I think was especially interesting was that Zena managed to take a special, unique, but highly photographed location right like these these tombs these pyramids like luxor is like a, a a place that even though most people haven't been you've seen a photo of luxor before right but she's managed to take that and weave it into the symbolism and themes of a film about a person going through a specific journey in a way that i found really inspiring and it was like the thing in our conversation that really struck me and i've been carrying with me since we had it so uh, I'm really grateful that we have that part of the uh, of the interview intact. I do want to mention um, though, but I think, that I think our listeners are very lucky in that they avoided all the times I tried to make the joke of thinking that she shot at the Luxor in Vegas. <sighs> yeah, that bit. I, you know, I'm a fan of that bit. I think that maybe I pitched her Luxor uh, 2. Kind of Luxor 2 Las Vegas, which at first sounds so dumb, but 
when you think about it, could be incredible. So, Zayna, listen, if you need a little bit of punch up or like, uh, you know, just some kind of some B-roll or whatever, let me know. Having stayed in Luxor a few times. Oh, have you? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, you know, as a, as a college kid. I feel like you're down you go to on Vegas Luxor, for no good reason. When I was younger, I feel like that was the Bellagio of a young person. <laughs> Well, so the the, thi- the Luxor, the Excalibur, there's a New York, New York. Those are all Treasure at one Island. Of the strip. Uh, Treasure Island next to like the M and M Museum and stuff, right? Like those are all the the casinos that were built when we were kids, when they were trying to make Vegas family friendly in the nineties. Yeah, I remember going to strip clubs for kids, and it was just uh, <laughs> Legos. Well. Dancing. <laughs> Do you remember it went from like, hey, bring your family to Vegas. It's great here to like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because they realized their marketing was exactly wrong. It's like, don't bring your kids. They're like, turns out we don't make that much money off these all you can eat shrimp buffet. (laughs) Anyway, enough about Vegas and bad bits. Um Let's talk a little bit about locations because, like we said, Luxor, Zena was really inspired by a lot of the different locations there and was really opportunistic in terms of building out a, a world and kind of painting a picture about the emotional state of a character using locations as a backdrop. And so locations more than maybe any other part is, is like a weird balance of logistics and and artistry, right? Like you can find a location that says everything you want about the emotional state of a character and it matches everything that you need or whatever. But also if there's like a really steep driveway, it could cause a big problem for you, you know, like from a production, you can't get your, from a production standpoint, yeah, you can't get your gear there. Yeah. Yeah. Or just load in time. How much time you have to shoot is affected by that location, you know? Yeah. Well, so yeah, I guess there's kind of two ways to think of locations and maybe, you know, we'll, we'll start with talking about what you're bringing up, which is like the logistics of a location and and how you choose one when you get a script that says, you know, interior house. Um, And then maybe after this, we'll talk about how locations inform the story, which is a different way of of thinking about it. The the creative process part. And probably kind of like, you know, Zaina has some Egyptian roots and so... She probably was looking for a story to set in Egypt in the same way that I really want to make a movie in Israel at some point, but I have not f- found the proper AM PM commercial to film there. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, so, you know, I think that there's a lot of directors out there who would think like at a certain point when you're shooting, you know, fancy TV spots and stuff that, you know, it can be somebody else's problem you know how long it takes a truck to unload or whatever but i think that it's always your problem it's always going to hurt your schedule in some way and that's going to hurt your creative process so like from my perspective i think being a little bit more production oriented than your standard director i think it it, it's all one and the same that that headspace is creative basically right you know how involved are you in location scouts usually or is it different on every project um you know that's interesting. I think that you're making me realize that um, I've only been on my sets, really, you know, from a scouting perspective. So there's only the way that I do it. But typically what I'll do is I'll work with a scout to pull a handful of references. Like, okay, like, you know, I'll describe what I'm looking for. Maybe I'll pull, I'll show them the boards that I've made or whatever. And then they'll kind of pull things and we'll base, they'll look at like, you know, where we need to be relative to talent and all of that stuff. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go through the photos. And then once I've gone through the photos, then I'll maybe do a little bit more digging myself. And then I go on a, a good number of scouts. I'm, I'm unhappy if it's only, if it's three locations or under, I would say. And so let's say you're scouting for like a house. So let's say you, you just did these Madden commercials recently, right? And you guys shot at a really cool house. Can you tell us about the process of how you go about finding that house what you describe and then if you know i'm also curious just for our listeners maybe some people that are a little outside of hollywood or newer to this like how much shooting at a house costs just location fees Mm, mm -hmm. you know i don't know how much that house cost yeah it wasn't like hey matt this is the expensive house hey matt this is the cheaper house honestly i probably was looking for something cheaper you know uh 
And when you say cheaper, you mean more affordable for the production or that looked less fancy? Both. I wanted it to look less fancy and therefore it was probably going to be less expensive. Because originally um, I find- wasn't the concept that it's like a famous football player who lives at this house, right? Yes, but the, that football player lived at a house that would be impossible to rent. There's no way anyone would ever rent a house as big as this man's house. His, his house was, it was a compound. It was multiple buildings. Like a mansion. Like four mansions. I was like, oh my That's God. That's where the real football like, player lived. Yeah. So was part of your thinking and you wanted to give him a house that seemed a little more accessible, that seemed a little less insane? Yeah, 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 exactly. Like no one can relate to a house that is... So so aspirational that it, like it just doesn't seem real you know he had it was like a, he had an estate he had a ranch right like you know ball, I mean? he's like a baller like literally yeah yeah but like but he was what's it's important to explain he didn't live in a major metropolitan city he didn't live he lived in near in a big city like the suburbs but he wasn't it wasn't los angeles it wasn't new york you know it wasn't paris like these denser cities like if you live in bel air you see, you know, the the establishing shot of French Fresh Prince of Bel Air or whatever. That house is millions and millions of dollars, but it is a single house. You can measure it clearly in square feet and acreage. The house that we were that he actually lived in would be four times as big as that, and have like a koi pond and, you know, I think it was ten acres or something. You know, it's it's like you would look at it and you wouldn't even realize that it was his house. None of that's important what's important is that I was trying to not just set a tone in terms of the scale of this character and where they lived, but also tell us about what part of the country we were in because we were shooting in Southern California in October. And so I didn't want to do the thing of like putting leaves on the ground and all of that stuff, you know, like I've done, I've done West Coast for East Coast before, before, and it's kind of a bummer and doesn't look great, you know? And I was just like, oh, let's do like a cool SoCal October backyard situation, you know, like. And how do you, how do you illustrate that it's SoCal? Um, I, I explicitly put everybody in like flip flops and like shorts and stuff. And I got some YouTube comments about it actually, which is funny. I was like, no, we're in San Diego, bro. They should have been like, they, I wish that people had been eating tacos. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Or tamales is what we should have had, actually. Do you think people great. notice that stuff? Um, like, I like the thinking behind it, but I'm curious if someone's watching a commercial, if they're like, hmm, it's October. Why are those people wearing shorts? I mean, I, like I said, I did get a YouTube comment on it. <laughs> right. Like, literally, that's what they said. Or sorry, but you, you put them in shorts in order to sell that they were in California. I, I guess if if they are surrounded by snow banks and there's no leaves on the trees and the, the trees are, uh, you know, or they're conifers or whatever, like not indigenous to California and, you know, you've got like a craftsman and stuff. Uh, great. Then, then, then people are like, "Oh, it's weird that that person's wearing shorts." But the opposite, to me, felt like it was the case where it was like we everything's palm fronds and like South African plants and stuff. Like most of the plants that we live in so- Southern California are like from Australia and South America at this point. Like they're it's tropical, is what I'm getting at, right? And so, to me, you know. I would see, I would constantly reference the scene in ET where they're like walking around in Southern California, it, like it's, it's Halloween and like, it's totally bright out. It's Amber, you know, the sun's still out and they're trick or treating. No one's wearing a winter coat, you know, like there's just ways that you can kind of subliminally code things for people. And so I wanted to lean into the environment that we already had, which is kind of to your point, Warren, right? Like because I knew that my location was Southern California from the inception of the pitch, I was like, let's make this a SoCal, you know, a uh, Halloween right. party. Have you ever had the opposite where people are uh, telling you to frame out the palm trees? Yeah. I mean, on Squaresville, I explicitly tried to frame out palm trees because I wanted it to feel less specific. I wanted it to feel like any town USA. Less, less Southern California. Yeah. I've done so like commercials. Spanish tiles are a big indicator on that too, you know? Yeah. I've done commercials where we literally use visual effects to hide palm trees, remove palm trees, change them to different trees. 
it's weird because I don't think I noticed those in commercials, but like every agency person will be like, oh, can we get rid of those palm trees? We do, this is supposed to play everywhere. It's not supposed to feel like a California thing. So, Oren, you have lived in Orange County and Israel. Yes, and Los Angeles and San Francisco. And Los Angeles and San Francisco. Okay, so San Francisco doesn't have palm trees. They don't? But I, think I mean, they do, but not. it's not in the same way. Right. I guess you're saying because I've always been surrounded by palm trees. Yeah, yeah. I don't notice. Yeah, but, but if there was a Christmas tree in the background, you would be like, that feels weird, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess maybe I'm painfully <laughs> unaware of palm, <laughs> palm trees. I live in this bizarro world of palm trees. <laughs> You've lived all over the world, but oh, palm trees were everywhere. I mean, it sounds like you're doing something right, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but okay, so you so you know the type of house you're looking for, and then what do you go on Pure Space or uh, you mm-hmm. know Airbnb, or do you do any sort of like hunting on your own, or does it kind of depend yeah, on the so, job again? So that's a great question. I, I'd love to kick it back to you because I think the thing. So, so those are all, you have basically two options. You can either hire a location scout whose job it is to have a catalog of different types of homes or different types of locations, whatever it is. Like they've just got their, their backlog of like, they've got everything that you could possibly need. Or there are like self-service sorts of uh, websites out there. You can do Airbnb and then kind of like figure out how to contact the, um, the owner and and figure out how to set up a scout with them or you know there are sites like gigster for what are you doing new year's our our second second location was uh we found through gigster and which is like airbnb but specifically for filming locations and you you can do cleaning through them you can get insurance through them there's like a handful of things that are built towards um, filming, which is really nice. They're not available in every single city, but uh, but I think they're continuing to expand. And then pure spaces like that as well. And what did you like about the place? Because I've seen that it's a beautiful house that you guys filmed in. What did you like about it? Like, why did you choose that house? I, you know, I think that w- you're trying to say something about the character from a socioeconomic perspective, right? But you're also trying to find a house that, you know, in the case of what are you doing? New Year's has like a telegenic kitchen that we can shoot in um but that's not or in like common spaces that are ample but not so big that it's going to be hard to get enough extras to fill them out you know things like that like i think that that one it was you had the laundry list of how many bedrooms you needed and then also the logistics of like the backyard like how does load in work all of that stuff the thing i was going to say the big advantage to me is between doing using a self-service website and a location manager is that um, or a location scout the people who elect to put their homes on peer space or gigster are doing it probably because someone once upon a time came over to their house and said your house is incredible you could shoot a music video here you know i my friend just made five thousand bucks last weekend where some rapper came and like shot a, the a scene in their infinity pool. It was so cool. Right. And so, and that is a, what a lot of those shoots are for sure. But the, the reason you decide to put your house on, on one of those websites is because it's ostentatious. It's unique looking. Right. It's got some, it looks like a feature. castle. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. It's got some wow factor. All the walls are pink. Yeah. My taste is like, I want to find the most suburban, charming, you know, run of the mill, all Americans ex- sort of homes. And so, like, it's always a challenge for me to find homes that feel lived in and aren't too quirky, but still have some character, you know? Yeah, I think all that stuff is is interesting. I, I, I know everyone that works in commercials knows this already, but I think it's worth saying, which is that... When you see a house on TV that seems just like an average American, like middle America house with no frills, it's probably an incredibly nice, very expensive house, especially if it's shot in L.A. Like here, if you want if you go to a one million dollar house in L.A., it's probably not nice looking enough to read as like, you know, your average American home in a commercial. Yeah. And have the space. Yeah. Right. Like. 
like the part of the people always used to make jokes about how big the friends apartment was so it's like oh like these two people live in this crazy giant new york apartment that's literally probably the size of eight people's apartments in new york but you just need room like it's nice to be able if you're shooting on location you don't have fly walls like i can't tell you how many times shooting squaresville which was all practical locations and most of them not 100 percent of them were donated it was just like you you were trying to figure out how to like make a shot work and not be up somebody's nose, you know? And we're just talking about two characters sitting on like a, a bed or something, you know? Yeah, no, I think, so I, I think to that point, like the first thing that I look for in a location when I'm either working with a scout and they're sending me pictures or I'm trying to find my own place, it, oftentimes I'll work with a scout and I won't really like anything they send me and I'll start <laughs> looking for things on my own and send them even if I'm just sending them a peer space or gigster link to show them the type of place I'm looking for, I think it's helpful, especially when we're looking for places that are furnished because that adds a whole other layer to the set, right? Like if you have super modern sleek furnishings, if it looks like a family lives there um, or somewhere in between mid-century modern versus uh, Spanish versus craftsman versus all that stuff and, and how the furniture plays into it is is such a big part. But I'm I like you. I'm always looking for a huge for as big a place I can find, but I am almost always n- looking for not open concept. As many layers and doorways and hallways and windows as possible, because I want to like when I see a location, I want to think like, oh, here's like a piece of foreground I can put, or look, they have like an interesting fireplace here, an interesting bar, or we can see the pool through this window, or we can see that. You know, the kitchen connects like we know we have a scene in the kitchen and we know that there's a character that's coming down the hallway to the kitchen. Like I try to kind of think of like the main shots of my whatever I'm working on. And then when I look at locations, I try to imagine them there. And to me, like you said, space is like something big is great because I know we can light it well (laughs) because we'll have a lot of room and put dolly track or whatever else we need. But then it's on top of that it's like the layers like to me the nightmare is like this huge orange county house where it's like a giant living room and and i've actually shot in a few places like that in like the valley and stuff in santa clarita where it's like wow look at this amazing kitchen but when you do a reverse shot it's like this gigantic like 2000 square foot living room and you're like ah this is just so much nothing with a big ugly tv yeah it's like like an l couch with like a hundred seats (laughs) So, yeah, I think that's saying. And then I guess the other thing that I've actually gotten much better about in the last few years, I used to never, ever, ever think think about it is um, like where the sun is at what time of day. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, sun, the sun is the other thing. Like I'll pull out. Do you use any sort of like sun seeker or Artemis or any of those? And I'll kind of kind of go I, by the out. like rises in the west sets in the east except sure or yeah, the yeah. other way around <laughs> rise in well, the east <laughs> sets in the west uh deal yeah but but also you want to see what the arc is yeah you know no what I, mean? I like if if there's mountains or something like that yeah i'm almost 95 uh, percent of the time i'm wrong about where i think the sun is from <laughs> but i do really like to fight for my dp and if i can like production designer at the scout obviously they're going to be at the tech scout but the tech scout you've already chosen your location Everyone's coming to check it out. But if they can't be at the scout, I will email them photos and the address. And I'll say, hey, I really like this place. What do you think? Production let, designer let and a DP. Something that I'm not really aware of, but I feel like oftentimes I want to bring my designer on the scouts. I agree 100%. I don't know. Do they get paid to, to do that? And am I like imposing on production by insisting they come? Yes and yes, but... Ultimately, it's better for it's production. Better for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. But I um sometimes I like to just know if I'm if I'm making that ask or not. You know. Yeah, but they can foresee problems. I mean, a lot of times, what'll happen with me is production will say, "Yeah, we don't really have them scheduled for a, an extra scout day," and I'll say, "Okay, well, can we?" Like the DP knowing where the sun is means he can figure out with the ad what the schedule is and it you know and he can also say like oh by the way this is going to save us five thousand dollars in lights because we don't need a 18k out the window anymore because the sun is going to be perfect right now um or a production designer can say 
like, oh, I can actually build this on a set for half the price that they want for this house. Um, and so, and then if they say, yeah, still no, which is pretty common, uh, I will then call the DP and the production designer. I'll say, Hey, look, I know you're not budgeted for this, but I'm going to go check out this location. Here it is. If you want to come by, you can, if not, maybe I'll FaceTime you from there and just show it to you. Cause I just want, you. I mean, you know, there's some locations where you and I, it's just obvious, like here it is. I mean, it's a hundred times better than the next best location. And the everyone else will make it work because it's so good but when it's when you're really trying to determine like the pros and cons between a few different locations like you said is there a super steep driveway is parking an issue i just shot a couple weeks ago and they're like just so you know our neighbor has called the police (laughs) before on film shoots here even though they're permitted and stuff so as long as you're not like having characters yelling a lot you'll be fine (laughs) Um, which we had a little bit of yelling and we just kind of scheduled it around like closer to the end of the day so that if we do get called on, then we'd be almost done, you know, just to kind of segue to the other location talk. Something that I love about location scouting is really getting inspired. So I just, this thing I did also a couple of weeks ago was about exercise. This guy basically trying to build a home gym and we had bought all this stuff that we were going to bring into this house, but the house itself had a pool and a trampoline at in it. And so, and even though there was nothing in the script about a pool or a trampoline, you know, you're there and you're like, Hey, if we shoot at this place, which is beautiful, by the way, wouldn't it be funny if there's a scene where like part of his exercise gym is this trampoline and he accidentally like falls into the pool, like, you know, which of course then necessitated a lifeguard and it was a whole big thing. But I love, love, love shooting on location whenever I can because I get inspired by the location. And when I'm shooting on set and it's a set build, it's like you you still get inspired by things and you try to find references. But I oftentimes prefer the real thing because I love the limitations as opposed to the blank slate. Yeah, the blank slate is really hard. And there's also this weird thing where sometimes... On my last build, originally we were going to shoot on location and then we realized we just, it would be easier and better and more achievable to do it as a set build. But then I kind of felt bad about, I felt guilty about kind of pushing for the set build and it really threw the budget out of whack and stuff. And so then every instance it was like, this, this wall should have some windows Or like, can we add a feature here where the, you know, it's meant to feel industrial. Can we do this? Can we do that? And so like, you feel like you're piling on, whereas every other instance, you know, those locations would just have windows, for instance, you know, so you feel, you feel a little guilty about asking for the things that you need. To be fair, you know, all of those locations were on the second story or were a complete nightmare to shoot in and would have been worse and harder in many other ways, but in that moment, it's hard to remind yourself of that. Yeah, no. Real locations give you so much. Like, I mean, and even the simplest things that you don't think about. Like, well, a window you do think about, but like there's a built-in bookshelf here. You know, if we want to do that on our set, that's an extra $1,000 in labor and filling up books and doing all these things that you get for free in a location. Yeah, I was going to just give like a random list of things that come to mind of things I love at like house locations and any location really. And like tall bookshelves are really amazing and staircases i love also in doorways um that's funny i sometimes i like staircases sometimes i don't sometimes i can it if i'm featuring the staircase yeah it's great but i feel like so often my back is against the staircase and all of a sudden i just wish i could move it you know they they feel like they're in inopportune places sometimes yeah i guess from like a composition standpoint i'm always finding myself especially when we're shooting on sets and even like real apartments and things is that people's lives are usually like built at eye level and down even though ceilings are you know like eight feet high or if you're shooting in some beautiful place like 10 feet higher really high and I feel like some a thing that can give a shot scope is things that go all the way up to the ceiling you know a wall full of portraits you know uh a bookshelf that goes all the way to the ceiling, curtains that are, go from the ceiling to the floor, anything that implies that uh, the frame continues. It obviously depends it's on what you're than, shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're no, shooting that's something point. that's, a good that's point. Yeah, yeah. supposed to feel barren or like, you know, lonely, it's one thing. But if you're trying to like build a world or whatever, it's nice when you have a staircase that just goes out of frame, you know? Like we know things continue. 
Um, that's my, I love sets. Like, you know, when sets have staircases, I think your cat commercial, right? The Russian one had sure. a staircase. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it, it adds so much. Like imagine, don't, don't you feel like it, oh, man. it doubles I the wish, value of the set? I, I want to, I'm going to send the production company that, that sentiment <laughs> oh why did they not because want they, the staircase they they were really sweet and really supportive but because the agency was like hey we really want this to feel lux and i was like okay well i could make it seem more expensive we could add a a staircase <laughs> um it will be in one shot and it will cost us about ten thousand dollars it's in one shot you we've seen i made animatics That's, this is where like it would we be. could buy 70 70- tr- Twitter trolls for that much money. If, if you really, really want to do that, we can. But do not be mad at me when it is in a single shot, which is going to be about a second and a half. And was it really only in a single shot? I mean, it's nice yeah, though, I, right? It, it adds. Actually, well, it's a commercial. Yeah. A single shot yeah. is like, you know, ten yeah, percent of the commercial. I think that maybe I worked it into the background of like it's a big cheat, but I worked it into the background of one of the characters, maybe because I felt so bad about it. But yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that, that's the life of a director is to beg someone for something, beg a crew member to make something work, and then you don't get to use it. <laughs> this was, I, I didn't care. I was like, if they want it, here's a way to do it. Here's the best way I can think of, and it's going to cost you this much money. Cards are on the table. You decide if you want to play it or fold it. This is such a tangent, but this, you know, I just shot this like Santa Claus thing, Santa's workshop, and there was a scene where Santa is building a gingerbread house. and. You know, it's Santa Claus. His gingerbread house should be the most amazing, gigantic, photorealistic gingerbread house that you've ever seen in your life. And so, you know, I was talking to the art department. We're trying to figure out how to do it. And they basically got this gingerbread house. And the prop master, she just worked so hard. She started working on her own gingerbread house. Then she went to this place that makes them professionally. And you got this gigantic gingerbread house in all the different phases of it. And the last one was like the most exquisite gingerbread house you've ever seen in your life and then the morning of the shoot the agency's like yeah we're cutting that scene <laughs> and, and i went to the to uh caitlin and caitlin they're both named caitlin, prop master and the production designer it's like hey uh just so you guys know that we're not going to do the the gingerbread house scene have you guys gotten all those props yet and they like they like spread apart to reveal <laughs> you know like a 10 foot tall gingerbread house and they're like please don't cut it and i was like okay i'll see if i can squeeze it in somewhere <laughs> I ended up not squeezing it in anywhere. No, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. But anyway, well. so locations, yeah. So I guess um, I, I love like going to a location. I know I just said this and, and changing the script because of the location. But I would say like a random tip I'm giving people that I've never actually done myself but almost have done a million times is if I was pitching a music video right now, maybe I would go to – peer space you know or gigster and just try to find insane insane houses and use those as the inspiration for a pitch because can you imagine if you went in and you're like hey here's the music video it takes place on this house that's built on the edge of a cliff and it's the theme is about a person who like is about to take a wrong move in their life and die or something yeah i don't want to mislead people i feel like those have like the tony stark mansion you know, or like the house in Bosch, like those houses. I don't know that they are on pure space. No, it's they have. Your, they oh, have really? palaces and stuff. Yeah, I mean, they have like wedding venues and things. Some of them. I mean, look, some are expensive. Some aren't. Almost all of them will cut some sort of deal with you. I mean, you know the um, that Bat Cave I shot at. I told you it was like crazy cheap. They they were on pure space and Gigster, but uh, but wait, it's wait, not. You mean like the Bronson Caves, Bat Caves? No, the um, where I shot with it, where the whole ceiling is oh, all lights. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, for listeners at home, there's there's two famous bat caves in Los Angeles: the Bronson Caves, which is from the Batman '60s, like the, he drives the Batmobile, you know, into the hole or whatever, which is in stuff all the time. You see the Bronson Caves and everything. It's like literally in Hollywood. Uh, but Warren's talking about a, a warehouse downtown with like where the, the whole ceiling is ceiling. lights. Yeah, that in Nolan's Batman, they used they built it for that, I think, right? And then they just kept it going. But you can, but it doesn't just have to be giant mansions. It could also be like you've seen the kitschiest houses ever, right? Where it's every room is different wallpaper or places with a ton of mirrors. Or remember for like a hot minute there, selfie museums were really popular. Mm-hmm. Sure. I went to the ice cream museum. Yeah. I was very it, disappointed because 
I thought that it was going to be a museum where I learned about ice cream. Oh, no. It's where you can take it, pictures. It, it was just good selfies. Of yourself, yeah. yeah. So as that concept was kind of dying down, all these selfie museums were on Peer Space and Gigster saying you can go shoot there. And they have, you know, like an infinite mirror room, like all these kind of crazy things. Here's a giant banana, <laughs> whatever, and a, you know, a pool filled with ice cream sprinkles or whatever. Did they die off because of the pandemic? Or just because people got sick of them? I think the pandemic kind of put a nail in the coffin. But a few of them that I toured for as film locations were basically shutting down because they're like, yeah, we were." it was almost like a pop-up. We thought it was going to last yeah. forever and it didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the ice cream museum, which I think was kind of like at the... the it was one, the vanguard of, um, of selfie museums was a pop-up downtown. Yeah. I still like kind of on a more macro level, I still kind of dream of like, you know, taking a trip. We went, we were in Italy together, you know, like it makes me think like, oh, it would be fun to set like a story in Florence, you know. Um, And I just watched On the Rocks last night, Sofia Coppola's movie. And it takes place in New York where she lives. uh, And her father, the Bill Murray character, starts out in Paris and he's speaking French and stuff. And uh, Sofia Coppola's husband is from Paris, so they spend a lot of time there. So, do you ever, do you ever like see a location or think of a location or visit a place and say like, oh, I should like write something for here? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think that I am interested in the in bringing the cinematic and the unique and the genre to mundane places, and so I think I'm constantly like trying to think of like what's the like, I want to shoot something in, like, Santa Clarita, which for listeners at home is, like, tracked homes. Right. And, um, That's why you love and freaking like, uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend so much. Yeah. Because it takes, yeah. where does it take place? West Covina. West Covina, yeah, which is right and, next to and, where I grew up. And, and it's just a runner of, like, shitty California towns. No it's offense not even shitty. It's just, like, the as generic as you get, right? As, like, nondescript. Yeah. Uh, like I shoot in the valley all the time, like big box parking lots, uh, like big manicured lawns, Burbank, like that's, that's kind of the tapestry that I like to paint in. So, um, so, you know, do I get inspired when I travel and I see an incredible location and things like that? Yeah, for sure. But I think I'm kind of trying to focus on, um, on a specific joke that I haven't (laughs) nailed yet. Right. I guess sometimes I see European films where you'll see like before sunrise or before sunset and you're like, every shot is amazing just because it's just two people talking, but they're in this incredible location, you know? Well, well, to bring it back to Luxor, and I think, you know, a a part that probably we we missed out on is that there is that indie move of just building a movie around a location or a town or, you know, yeah, like a, a spot. Right. That is going to give you tremendous impact and production design. And inform everything, right? Clark Duke had his movie Arkansas, right? Um, which I know it's based on on pre, pre a pre-existing story, but I think what he loved about it is how it channeled the people of Arkansas. And I mean, you know, we've seen so many movies about places that are really great. I don't know if I ever mentioned this on the podcast before, but you know that like one of my first jobs in L.A. was going on tour with Keith Urban. Uh, I was... You, you haven't talked about it in a long time, but that's funny. I was just a, a cameraman on his tour. We were making a video of his tour, and, you know, we were in tour buses, and every day we would go to sleep, and when we'd wake up, we'd be in a new city because they would drive us while we're sleeping on the tour bus, and then you would be in this gigantic venue. You would be, you know, in, in, Madison, in Madison, Wisconsin at the... A giant field you know or wh- wherever keith urban was performing next for yeah the, tens the of biggest of venues in the country yeah 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 and i was always shocked that there was no tv show that takes place you know on tour i was like we could shoot that show if we had like a few actors with us it's so fascinating i mean just between the crew members the musicians the celebrities the chefs the grips you know um the camera crew the groupies the crazy local people the venues and it, these are and the scope would just be giant you'd have like a fifteen thousand. almost con- famous almost famous gives you a little bit of that though right yeah but it's not a tv show yeah it's a movie yeah i think there's a lot there's quite a few movies like the 
musician on tour movies. But as a TV show, almost you could do a reality show. And, and now I guess in the past few years, it is kind of popular to have like, you know, a Taylor Swift movie or whatever, Beyonce movie or a Katy Perry movie showing you these people on tour. But like, you know, when you're on tour with Keith Urban or whoever, there are like a th- like hundreds of people. I don't remember how many people are on tour, but so many people build this ecosystem that is going on this tour that I always was inspired by that as, you know, like a location and a setting for a story that should be told because there's so many, such a, such a rich well of personalities and kind of weirdos on tour. It's kind of like extras too. Do you remember that show? Oh yeah. Yeah. Extras. Yeah. There's a little bit. Little I lived that show, man. I was an extra. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, cool. Did you, uh, did you look? Yeah, I, I, I had been bothering me for so long. We had Martha Stevens on, you know, kind of a while ago now. She made a movie, uh, called To the Stars. But before that, that one of her big breaks was a movie called Land Ho. That's just like a two hander that takes place traveling throughout Iceland. And it's, it, to me, it's the ultimate example of like, it's funny, it's quirky, it's great, got great dialogue and great characters and stuff, but then it's all against the backdrop of the most stunning locations you can fathom. And even in comedies, like thinking of like, I think that was a comedic, but even like a Darjeeling Limited or something, you know, it's the, it's, it is, and I know that those are different orders of magnitude of movies, but I would love to shoot something in another country and just really get into it. Well, fingers crossed for you, Oren. Make it happen. Thank you. I mean, I <laughs> shot in upstate New York, so, you know, I got, I got hey, close. Hey, there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, cool. Well, before we uh, wrap up here, we do happen to actually have our unpaid endorsement segment with Sena. Should we pop into that? Let's do it. Unpaid endorsements. You know what I keep on talking about, which is so embarrassing, but it's the thing that keeps on coming in. Okay, there's obviously Steve McQueen's Mangrove. Have you guys seen, do you guys have access to that? It's a series oh, about, no, um, it's really great. It's um, it's about my area that I, uh, where I live now. And um, it, oh, I'm super close. Um, it's like um, the kind of Westbourne Park um, area, like Notting Hill. Um, mm-hmm. And um, back in the day, and uh, it's, it's a really interesting series. Really, really good. That's been amazing. That's with BBC. And apparently he made it with BBC because he wanted his mother to watch it, be able to watch it because she doesn't have any of the streaming <laughs> stuff. And I just love that that's what that's he so did. So I love sweet. him for that. I really love him as a filmmaker. He's also very, un- he's just brilliant. And then the other thing, which is so embarrassing and so the opposite is the other day I found the original Dynasty on Amazon. And if you watch the pilot, it's actually really well made. It's probably better made than most art house films nowadays. Like they have really wide shots and they let Blake Carrington cross the whole set. And there's even mm-hmm. like moments where Blake discusses Freud with his son because uh, Freud's Freud because his son's gay and they discuss Freud. I mean, that's like a soap opera. And I just think that like, yeah. that, if, that, if you use that as like a standard, you understand how far we have come culturally in, in the years since Dynasty is a soap opera was discussing Freud and had wide shots. And now, like, you wouldn't even get that in, like, a highbrow movie. That's quite fascinating. I don't know. What's the premise of Dynasty, right? It's, it's like, oil tycoon? That's who shot JR, right? Is that No, the, that's Dallas. That's the same yeah. show. Yeah. Right? Oh, that's Dallas. You're right. They're both yeah. oil. Yeah. This is Colorado. They're, oh, okay. Colorado versus Texas. And they remade Dynasty in 2017. But you're talking about the original. Of course. The original. 1981. Watch the pilot. It's quite amusing. They even have a moment when one of the oil workers who's like part of the plot because he's kind of in love with Blake Carrington's wife and there's this whole thing, but his wife had a nervous breakdown and blah, blah, blah. like typical soap. Anyway, he gives his wife, he gives his daughter a pendant he brought back from the Middle East, which is this beautiful pendant with Islamic calligraphy. Could you imagine that being given in a soap opera nowadays? Mm-hmm. It was just right. so perfect. Yeah. It was like... Even the production design was good. You know, it's it's funny. I you're talking. We we're talking about Dallas and and Dynasty, uh, and like just the there's like a specific era where like being an oil baron was especially 
dramatic, right? Like there's generations of family. They're on big, I'm thinking about like giant or something like that, you know, like there's something really um, cinematic, operatic about like a family and like all of their different progeny and like vying for the money that you don't, I guess because of corporations now, you don't really have those same sort of dramatic stakes. You have that Murdoch series. What was the Murdoch series called? Uh, oh, you mean Succession. Is that what you're thinking? It's like the the dramatized. Yeah, yeah. The succession is incredible. Yeah, that's the. I, I guess that's a good point. Like you swap out media empires for for oil fields, but but still, that's not even yeah, shot as well as Dynasty shot, and sh- and it's shot on film. Hey, I don't know. Succession is shot pretty well. I, I beg to differ. That's a good. It's shot know. well, <laughs> and I think maybe I actually know this. Like, yeah, it's shot very well. Don't get me wrong, but if you look back. Din- this, the pilot of Dynasty is shot on film, and maybe maybe mm. Succession's shot on film. I don't know. Actually, I think maybe a friend of mine shot it. I'm blanking now because I'm so tired. But yeah, just look back and you'll see this like mainstream TV show is shot really well, and you'll be so shocked, and you'll see really how like you know how like Italian truck drivers would go and see Fellini movies, and that was like the normal because mm-hmm. like everyone would go. Like it was like you, everyone from all sure. the yeah. baker, the lawyer, whoever, everyone goes together and sees these movies. And it just shows how the language of cinema has been dumbed down so much that they think that people don't get it, but it's not true. People can and do have the propensity to get that language, that more complex language, but they're not given the chance to. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, really good. Um, Well, speaking of uh, dumbed down recommendations. You want mine? uh, uh, Well, no, no, (laughs) mine. (sighs) To be honest, uh, I've been like, you know, it's, pretty down lately and uh i know that people i watched british bake off a little bit um but like got heavy into it this week and it was uh the background noise that i needed to just like hang out and and and, like feel better for a minute (laughs) let me tell you this latest season was really wonderful but the thing that i think actually is the most worth talking about i guess beyond like whether you like a, a reality show or not is that um here in the states they were releasing them weekly and so you you got that water cooler you could get on twitter you could talk to a friend or my mom or whomever and talk about what was happening on the show and because basically everyone's binging everything all the time, no one's got any synchronicity to when they're watching something. And so the opportunity to just talk about it is gone, you know. So The Undoing was released in, in series here. Mm-hmm. Like like I'm sure it wasn't like on HBO, right? So we have Sky Atlantic. It was it, it mm-hmm. was released like that. And it's so true what you're saying. Because I was getting coffee in the morning after dropping my girls off at school and I heard like six mums discussing the plot with coffee and I couldn't stop laughing because I haven't I haven't heard like oh no why did that happen and it was like they were discussing like what had happened this the night before so then they would understand like where they were now in the series you know and it was really interesting because I hadn't had conversations like that you know normally you have like more Mm -hmm. general like like you were saying like the themes of I mean it was a bit worrying Mm -hmm. because we've been watching a lot of The Crown in England and on my morning mm-hmm. walks, I pass by the barracks where like a lot of the horses mm-hmm. in their regalia like practice. And me and my friend were laughing so much. She's an illustrator. She's also from New York. And we were saying that and we were filming these horses and we we're like, before the crown, would we have cared about these horses? Why are we so into filming these horses right now? It was so funny because it was so random. But um, you get like so absorbed into these worlds, is my point, that even these Mm -hmm. horses and their uniforms start to become something that you feel as like your life because you've been living these like nonstop 10 hours of the crown. You know what I mean? Whereas like if it's drip fed, it's a bit more healthy. It doesn't Mm -hmm. become your reality. And a little more social, which I think uh, we're all kind of craving nowadays. No, that's really cool. Oh, it's funny though, Matt, who is a person that I'm sure references the Criterion Collection at minimum once a day, watches more reality tv than anyone would Late, expect boy this year yeah like it's Flores yeah, lava so was one of its big Flores lava recently i did boy i just need like something on in the background to like keep myself sane that is true but look you gotta have your junk food and your health food that's what i'm talking about right you well, know what i mean like yeah matt already did a pretty good job of offsetting your artfulness with his recommendation but i'm gonna just bring it all the way home and I'm going to double down on this recommendation I made on our last episode. 
it was a pre-recommendation. I said I was about to go check out this person's YouTube channel. And I literally spent like, I've watched every single video on his video channel uh, since we recorded last time. His name is Hayden Hillier Smith. He's Logan Paul's vlog editor. And this guy is a genius. <laughs> I mean, he is like so good at talking about editing at talking about music editing at talking about rhythm at talking about um how sound effects and uh expectations and emotions work and he made this one video i'm going to recommend a specific one which is his commentary on this guy david dobrik he's like probably one of the fam most famous vloggers on youtube he made this video a few months ago uh where he's teamed up with ea uh, electronic arts the video game company and it, it, so it was a sponsored vlog video, but where they basically gave him, I think they gave him a bunch of money to give away for COVID. So we had a list of all these people that were having trouble, you know, making ends meet with COVID, like kind of, a, you know, South Central LA, like the place, like all these places around California where people are really having trouble making ends meet. And he would literally just go over there and just hand random people iPads and PlayStation 4s, like just on the street. He would just find people. So that was kind of step one. Then he starts throwing Frisbees at people. And they catch him like out of his car, you know, because it's COVID. No one's getting close to each other. They catch him and he's like, look inside. And he had like a thousand dollars in cash taped to the inside of every Frisbee. And then he, he like there's this moment where he goes and he, there's this couple. I think she was like a fan of his or something. Uh, this couple, they're standing outside an apartment. Um, and he's like, hey, can I fire a T-shirt cannon at you? And she's like, uh, OK. And he fires a T-shirt cannon at her, this T-shirt at her. And she opens I, it I up. I fired a T-shirt cannon at many people. It's oh. not that bad. It's okay. Well, it seems kind of <laughs> aggressive, but she's like, oh, okay. And he's like, he's like, I got you that t-shirt. And she's like, oh, thank you. And she knew him. I mean, she's a fan. And he's like, by the way, there's a $10,000 check inside. And she opened it and there's a $10,000 check. And then it's a montage of him giving all these families $10,000 checks. And at the end, I mean, I'm totally spoiling the whole movie, the whole video. But at the end, this is a four minute video. He's like giving, he's like, hey, Monica or whatever, what's up? We, we got your email about, you know, making having trouble making ends meet, whatever. And then he just like holds out a broomstick. He's like, we got you something. And like, there was like a, like a bag, like a silver bag on it. He's like, just pull the bag off. And they'd pull the bag off and there'd be like a car key in there. And then they would just drive off with their van and there'd be like a car with a bow behind it. I mean, they were literally just giving away cars to all these people that are having trouble making ends meet. And it's, it's so good. And, and I watch the video and it's, it's pretty emotional and stuff. But watching Hayden Hillier Smith dissect why it's emotional, like was even more emotional to me. Because for, for some reason, I love people talking about like the art, you know, the intention behind art. It like makes me emotional. I, you know, I talked about like Into the Unknown, the documentary about the making of Frozen 2, which like I was so emotional about for some odd reason. But so watching Hayden Hillier Smith uh, his video is called How to Make a David Dobrik Vlog, like just dissect why this strikes like from a musical point of view, from a rhythm point of view, how he keeps it fresh and funny, but emotional and moving at the same time. It's just it's just such a good analysis of what makes good editing. And, you know, I, I Matt and I, we work in comedy a lot and I've worked with a lot of great editors, but like I kind of want them to have to watch his stuff because... So many times I work with editors that are not like editing the music well. They're not. They're like, well, this is the rhythm of the music. So I don't know. What, I, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, I want you to edit the music, like change the rhythm. You're the editor, you know, and he he's really good at showing how that's done and why it works and about getting rid of things that aren't important. And I don't know. I'm just a huge fan. Hayden Hillier Smith. So thanks, Zaina, for talking to us. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, we love to hear from you. Email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. You can follow us on all social media at justshootitpod. We've been posting a lot of things. Thanks to Derek Aiello, our social media uh, wizard. And you can follow me. I'm on Instagram at ocaplin. And I am on Twitter at smiteypileg. Which maybe I like, maybe people just don't find me on Twitter because my handle is so dumb. You think that's I think that may be true. <laughs> I think you should change it, is what I'm telling Can you. Can you change your Twitter handle? Yeah, I think so. Give it a shot, bro. Well, you can find uh, me at Mr. Maninlow across all social media, including Twitter and Instagram, but also Letterboxd. Follow me on Letterboxd. I've been getting into that lately. It's been fun. I don't watch a ton of movies, but um, but uh, I, and I don't really write reviews. But like, if you want to keep track of what I'm making, and I'll follow you back. I love to see what uh, what people are watching. It's been really fun. That's kind of the only 
social media experience that is um, anxiety free. Right. Basically, so. And if you can't find me on Twitter because I've changed my my handle from at Smitey Pileg, um, it's probably at FKA Smitey Pileg. So <laughs> uh, you can look that one up too. Uh, anyway, this episode was edited very craftily by Sarah Weirda. Our social media manager is Derek Aiello. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And the music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.